You know, when I decided to be a National Park Ranger when I was seven years old, I imagined a life of adventure, a lot of time outside in the places that I love, learning about animals and plants and things like that. And um, since I've been doing this since 1986, I've had a lot of those experiences and they've been great. I've been fortunate enough to visit 252 out of the 419 national parks. And um, it's what I really love to do. I love national parks, what can I say? Um, the one I love probably more than any other is uh, Biscayne National Park because it's where I've spent most of the last 30 years of my life. What I didn't expect being a park ranger was working from home for weeks on end. And I bet a lot of you out there can relate to that. Um, the hassles of computers and dealing with stuff if you are indeed fortunate enough to be able to do some things from home. The hassles of kids and cats that walk across the keyboard and so many other things. Um, Certainly laundry is lower, that's, that's kind of nice. And no, I don't normally wear my uniform um, working from home. And despite the appearance around me, I am working from home. I wanted to share with you today what I decided to do, what we as a family decided to do when we moved into uh, our home several years ago. We decided that we we're gonna get rid of all of our grass. We have no grass, we have no lawnmower. Um, instead, we planted native plants. Our entire front yard is all native plants. And I thought that maybe today I would take you out for a little walk in my front yard, which is not a big place. It's not gonna be a long walk, but uh, there's a lot of stuff here in my yard that you would find in Biscayne National Park. A little bit. And but I wanted to share with you some of my favorite plants that we have here. This one up here is a big one, and it's got a, a twin over here and these are paradise trees and paradise trees are dioecious that means they have two separate sexes and we were just lucky enough lucky enough to uh to get one male and one female and what that means is that in the spring we get lots and lots of fruit from the male over here giving uh pollen to uh to the female over there and uh, so we get lots and lots of fruit, and that means in the summer we'll get lots and lots of little baby trees, like thousands of baby trees. We've given them to the neighbors. Um, we usually pull them out because you don't really want a lawn that's full of one kind of tree. That kind of defeats the whole purpose of having a native yard. But they're a beautiful shade tree, um, lovely leaves, and squirrels love them, birds love them. We have nests up there and uh, they grow relatively quickly. These trees are about 12, 13 years old right now. So paradise tree. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? We have some palms here and our yard is kind of designed to look like a hammock that you might find in, in a natural area with the exception of that we have things in a much higher concentration here. So you might not normally find the, uh, the silver palm and that's why it's called a silver palm, the way it reflects the light off the back of the leaf there. You might not find that in the hammocks, but uh, we've got it here and we've got a few of them. And they struggle for light a little bit because when we put them in, they, were, um, they had more light, but then the trees grew up around it. So um, the philosophy in this yard is we don't take care of anything except for the first short while. After that, all these plants are on their own. It's a tough love philosophy, but that's the beauty of native plants. They can survive on their own. So we have a couple of those here. We have one other big tree here, and this is a strangler fig. And uh, strangler figs often get their start with uh, a bird dropping a seed up at the top of another tree. And it sprouts and starts to grow. And that's when you'll get these long roots like you see here coming down. It is a, a type of uh, banyan or fig tree. So uh, a lot of people don't like these because the roots do spread all over the place and that can cause some problems, but we tried to put it far enough away from the house that it wouldn't be so problematic. We do have another tree that got uh, shaded out a bit by the uh, strangler fig and that is a mahogany. And the mahogany is easily 
identified by the by the leaves that are um, not evenly split. It's a, a split that goes down the side. It looks like the leaf is bent to one side and it's made up of, of leaflets, a composite leaf. So you can recognize that. These are also the ones that have those big uh, seed pods on them that if they're put in a parking lot will come down onto your car and dent your hood. Um, what else do we have here? Another silver palm here. This one is kind of cool. It's uh, it's good for the edge of your yard if you don't want people coming into your yard because this is a wild lime. And this is one that uh, grows in Biscayne National Park as well, but you can find it at nurseries. And uh, it is one of the primary food plants for the Shouse swallowtail butterfly, one of the most critically endangered animals in Biscayne National Park. And if you look closely at uh, at the leaf, you'll see it's got little leaflets in between the leaflets there along the stem. That gives it a little more, um, little more photosynthetic surface out there. So uh, kind of cool, but it's also full of thorns and it doesn't get fruit on it, at least nothing appreciable that people can eat. But it is a favorite food for the Shouse Swallowtail Butterfly. And even though we don't expect to have Shouse Swallowtail Butterfly here because we just don't have enough habitat, um, we still plant the plants and, and hope that maybe someday someone will find it and other swallowtails certainly enjoy that plant as well. Let's see what else we have here. Um, yeah, this is our, uh, our former maple tree and rather than hauling it away and putting in something else, we just decided to let the stump rot in place. All the Tillandsia air plants that were, uh, were in it, we kind of piled up on top and they're still doing okay. And uh, eventually this will all come away as well. But uh, it's kind of like letting nature take its course out here and giving us uh, a little bit more of a natural experience. This is one that's much more often out in open areas. And this is the beautyberry. And it really is a beautiful little flower. It's, it's a little bit scraggly. It, it runs wild, but it does get beautiful bright purple fruit, which I'm not seeing much of on here. Here's some down here near the ground. And a beautiful bright purple fruit. And the birds love these. So if you want birds in your yard, um, when this is in fruit, they will usually come and take that away immediately. This is a uh, this is a real common plant and you can find it everywhere. And once you get it established in your yard, you'll probably find you get a whole lot more of it. This is wild coffee and uh, it's got beautiful little flowers on it. They're very tiny little white flowers that eventually will turn into little reddish brown coffee like beans. And that's how it gets its name because it looks like coffee, but doesn't really taste like coffee. Um, interestingly, I think the scientific name of this is pretty cool. It's Psychotria nervosa, so psycho crazy, uh, and that makes it kind of fun. This one over here is uh, wild, uh, no, it's not wild lime, this is torchwood. Torchwood has little leaflets of three, and you see somebody's been chewing on our version here. But uh, this is also one of the primary food plants for the Shouse swallowtail butterfly. And that's another great advantage to having a lot of native plants in your yard is that if you do, you're likely to, uh, to find that the butterflies will come to your yard as well. So lots going on here. There's another butterfly plant that I spotted earlier over here. And this is, uh, this is one that we didn't put in. You'll find that once you start to have um, native plants in your yard, animals will come by and they will plant things for you. So I think this uh, corky stem passion vine was probably planted by a bird who ate one of the tiny little fruits, only about the size of a pea, and uh, dropped it, pooped it out, and uh, provided us with uh, a plant here in the yard. It gets a beautiful little passion flower. It is not bright red or purple like many of them are. It's a tiny little green flower, and uh, they're beautiful. This one's not in bloom right now where I'd show you, but uh, it's, a, it's an easy one. And this is a, a primary food source for the zebra heliconia butterflies, the orange julias. So you can get other butterflies in your yard if you have this plant around. Now, just because it's a native yard doesn't mean you can't kind of personalize it and make it a little bit more, uh, 
more peaceful. So we, we tend to put a little bit of art in our yard, tranquilo. Now this one is called Kunti. It is a, a native cycad here in South Florida and it actually has some historic significance as well. It was uh, cultivated in Miami for a long time before Miami was even Miami and it was marketed as Florida arrowroot. And it is the host for another butterfly that's pretty cool here, the Atala butterfly, which is just gorgeous. So thanks for coming on this uh, short little walk through my yard. It's, uh, it's not a lot and I understand that a native yard might not be for everyone. But I'll tell you what, over these past few weeks with all the stress and really scary stuff that we are going through, my native yard has become a real source of comfort and consolation and gives me just a little reminder of um, what I have to look forward to when all of this mess is over and we can go back to enjoying and loving and experiencing our national parks. Y'all stay safe, stay at home, wash your hands, and uh, we'll see you when this is all over. Thanks for joining me.